Thank you. All right. Give this up. We will bring now this uh, February 14th Valentine's Day public safety meeting to no, order. Sorry. I didn't give that uh, up. I am here. Council Member Evans, Council Member Fullerton, and Council Member Baldwin are all here. We'll start with item number one on reports East Pierce Fire and Rescue, Chief Parkinson. All right. I'll be a little longer than normal today since it's been a couple months, but uh, starting off with the staff report on page three of your packet, um, what you're looking at there only shows a month worth of stats, so it's um, not very impressive to look at, but I'll just recap some of our 2022 stats, which aren't in there, and just uh, specific to Bonnie Lake. So in the Bonnie Lake service area, we had a 6.97 or 7% increase year over year. So just in the in kind of Bonnie Lake proper, ran just under 2,400 incidents last year. Uh, flipping over to, I'm going to skip forward a few pages here and go to page six. Um, we ended up uh, with incidents at 12,653 last year. Um, so something like a half percent year over year increase from the prior year. So fairly flat year as far as uh, total incident volume went. Flipping over to page seven where it breaks out incident by units again, kind of earlier in the year. So it looks like engine 111, medic 111, uh, the Bonnie Lake units are, they show downward arrows right now. But uh, for last year, uh, the engine company was a 7% year over year increase running almost 3,500 incidents. And the medic unit was up over 10% at 10.2% year over year increase at uh, running just under 2,800 incidents. So uh, both of those units uh, keeping pace, medic, uh, medic 111 out of Bonnie Lake is always our busiest medic unit and the engines in second place right behind the ladder truck out of, out of Sumner. So uh, page eight pie chart that breaks out uh, incident by type, nothing unusual there for 2022 our actual EMS breakout was 73.77% uh, of incidents being medical. So pretty typical, about three quarters of our incidents are gonna be medical in nature. Uh, next couple pages, just walk through transports and just tracking some specific uh, incident volume out into Holly. But um, just some other items to close out and bring you up to date since the last time I spoke with you. And if these are repetitive, then, um, then sorry, but I don't think they are. Uh, so we did approve our budget back uh, in late November, uh, the result to taxpayers, so your taxpayers as well as all of ours, uh, would be a 2.1% year over year increase. A uh, number of big initiatives in there, um, and it's making sure that we have staffing to open two additional stations beyond what we staff today. So in the fall of this year, we'll be staffing our Milton Fire Station, um, so that'll go from just having one station in the Milton Edgewood area to having two. Um, then also staffing the Tahali station once it's complete, which will be about this time in 2024. But um, just for doing the hiring in advance, we need to get that done now. So uh, both those uh, stations do have a, a downstream impact on Bonnie Lake that's actually pretty profound. Uh, so it will uh, have a downstream effect of having your unit in your city more often, more reliably. So in addition to that, order two more fire engines and three more medic units. Um, I just note those things because uh, a fire engine used to take us a little less than a year to get. <laughs> right now, they're three and a half years out to, if we buy one. So these are actually 2025 purchases that we made a few months ago. Well, in the months that we'll get by 26. They come with an evidence locker? Uh, uh, yeah. The, so, the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and medic units are about the same. I know everybody's dealing with the same thing with staff vehicles, but uh, they're just tough to get our hands on. So. Uh, back in January on the 7th, we did have a fatality fire down in the Sumner Glen Apartments. Um, appeared to be accidental uh, accidental in nature, so just FYI. Uh, station construction. Um, Ed Edgewood Station is nearing completion, so it'll have substantial completion um, as of mid-next month. So we're hoping to be moving into that facility by mid-April. Uh, Bonnie Lake Station, while it looks like a pile of mud over there, it's actually making very good progress. Contractors still slightly ahead of schedule over there, so trying to deal with the natural spring that we ended up finding and so we've got to divert some water. <clears throat> uh, Lake Tap Station bid closed on that process, so we're awarding the bid tomorrow night. Uh, Tolly Station should break ground here in late spring. Prairie Ridge Station breaking ground this fall. Uh, financial audit, we completed financial audits of 20, uh, fiscal year 2020 and 2021, so two years, both clean audits, so good news for us. Uh, we're also kicking off an external look at our finance process uh, with an independent CPA firm, Clark Duber. So 
I always like to brag that they're the auditors of the state auditors. So, so we're bringing in them just to look at best practices and how we're doing. Uh, as far as hiring goes, uh, our fall class of seven personnel graduates this Friday, so they'll be hitting the street soon. Our safer grant class of 12 employees started Academy last Monday. Um, so that's our group of 12 personnel, which are primarily uh, being hired to staff the Tahali station. That's the federally funded positions. Um, and then our next recruit class, we're in the process of hiring right now. So that'll be another nine to 12 people that'll, that'll start up this fall in Academy. So beyond that, just big organizational pushes that we have going on in 2023. Uh, number one was doing what's known as a standard of cover community risk assessment. So it's doing a deployment analysis and also evaluating our hazards and risks within the community to make sure we're deploying our, our units appropriately. That was about a one year project and we wrapped that up just a few weeks ago. So on the heels of that, then we'll do a complete deployment, uh, look over and overhaul of how we're deploying units. Are they being deployed in the right spots? Um, the right number of units going on the right type of incidents. Like I said, we also have uh, station 124, which is our Milton station, which will be going online this fall. Just put a medical service officer unit, so that's a 24 seven uh, medical supervisor in service on February 6th. And so right now it's intermittently staffed based on the availability of the three uh, personnel that are assigned to it. But by May, it'll be a constant staff unit. So 24 seven, 365. Right now it runs out of Bonnie Lake until our Edgewood station gets staffed up. And then last big push that we have, and this is more of a uh, county wide push is uh, five organizations, East Pierce being one of them, but Grand Fire and Rescue, Central Pierce, West Pierce, Fording and us um, all collectively made the decision last year to co-locate our training division divisions into one building. So um, as of the first of this year that put, uh, I think we're up to 21 personnel that are serving as one training division based out of, of uh, Central Pierce Fire Station. So that, that group though collectively delivers training to, to 760 firefighters. So, so that's kind of a big deal though. It expands our training division from three personnel to over 20. So we get a lot more utility out of that at really no increased cost to taxpayers. So. What were those uh, jurisdictions? So that's Central Pierce, Graham, Ording, and West Pierce, and us. That's known as the Pierce County Fire Training Consortium, or if you like acronyms, PCFTC. <laughs> that is all that I have. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go on to item number two, uh, police report, Chief Heater. All right. I will cover our report for last month. I sent the one from December. Um, and if you've had a chance to review, it's another active month for us. Some of the highlights. Uh, Quite a few DUIs over the holidays, a lot of people who are not wanting to stop for us, believe it or not. Um, a big one is the location of a gun at the school, at Bonnie Lake High School. They have, I can't remember the acronym for it, but there's something online where you can report suspicious activity to the school district. And the school district, somebody reported that this kid had brought a gun to school the previous week. So our officers were in place. The kid showed up to school, principal interviewed him, didn't have a gun, let him search his backpack and all that, nothing on him. We had, in fact, Darren, our SRO was out of country. He was in Thailand for two weeks. So we didn't have an SRO. So one of our officers, Bonnie Lake High School grad, Taylor Graham, uh, volunteered for overtime to be the SRO and he stuck around for the day. The kid went back out to his car and came back out. Officer Graham went outside, looked in the car, and there was a gun on the seat. So don't know what his intentions were, but for an 18-year-old to have a firearm, let alone at school, very alarming. But uh, the officer did a great job by following up and going out to the car and, uh, I think, averted a tragedy by by doing that. So obviously, the the kid got kicked out of the school for the, the remainder of the year. I think he was 18 anyhow and on his way to graduation, but um, definitely averted a disaster by the extra step the, officers, the officer took. And we did uh, issue that officer uh, a letter of commendation for his efforts too, because that was a, a great job there. Uh, we had a uh, tragedy too. We had a child of one of the Sumner teachers pass away unexpectedly. And uh, 
it was yeah very very sad i think he was 13 active male that appears to be medical but still a tragedy nonetheless we lost a <clears throat> youth from our community the uh, you'll see on the back is our full year report for crime stats and again i, I generally caution about comparing year to year but our NIVERS offenses, which are all the things listed in that top box there, are up 20% over <clears throat> 2021. And in 2021, they were up 26% over 2020. So 46%, use my WSU math there, <laughs> jumped since 2020. And a lot of the things that you can predict, thefts, burglaries, uh, motor vehicle thefts are off the charts. Um, domestic violence were up, destruction of property, DUIs, uh, very, very active year for us. Calls for service were up for us approximately 26% over 2021 as well. So again, the officers were very active, um, a, a just a, a very busy year, and, and it hasn't slowed down the first part of this year either. That's the uh, report. If you have any questions, I do have a few FYI items. If you'd like me to cover those now or later, if yeah, there are no please. questions. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you have, uh, other than the percentage, do you have the number for 2020 for the total numbers? I do, but I don't have that with me. Okay. We're working on our year-end report, and I'm okay. waiting for to, the state to get back to me. I requested our traffic data as far as citations okay. and the sex and race of the people that got tickets okay. so we can add that the rest of it is is pretty much done i'm hoping to have that out mid to late march depending on when i get the stats back but if you want 2020 i, I can get that 2020 to you. And okay. i could probably email you those after the meeting that'd be great find an email. perfect and that'd you know what good. they might be on our website too our year-end reports for 19 and 20. Okay. They, they should be on there perfect. and i think we do a three-year look back yeah. on our annual report okay so if you you can look at 19 and you'll get back to 16 and so on. It should be on our website too. Chief Teeter, can I ask? Uh, everything's up, but traffic citations charged are down. Yes, ma'am. Is that because of the Can't laws? Pull them over. Uh, a little bit of both. People aren't stopping for, for, for one of those. They don't want a ticket. Yeah, they don't want a ticket. And uh, officers have been reluctant because of accusations of racial profiling. They are making the traffic stops, they're just not writing as many citations. So uh, that that's one of the reasons. Couple of the reasons why the citations are actually down, and we don't have a traffic unit anymore. Trying to yeah, make sure that we're with our calls for service being up. We used to have two dedicated traffic officers. Those are folded back into patrol now to help cover with call volume. So that's a big one. Those were responsible for the uh, 1,100 tickets a year each. We don't have that. Change. Yeah, that's all they did was focus on traffic. And we don't have that. Either. Well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but I believe that for the ones that the officers are pulling over and the ones that pull over voluntarily, I think they've been lenient. lenient on, yes, because on that. they will stop, and the officers are appreciative of them stopping, so they haven't been writing as many tickets if people comply. Yeah. For things like driving while suspended, no insurance, they typically will still cite, but for the speed, they'll generally give a verbal warning uh, most of the time, yeah. unless we're having an emphasis patrol. Okay. Any, any other questions on that report? I was wondering what happened the other night. Be more specific. It's uh, busy weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was last week on the 410. The, the high assault. The, the, well, no, there was a big, huge car crash. And uh, again, which like one? The car, <laughs> there was one right here yeah, at the Rainier Dental, and then there was one at 192nd, you know, within a couple hours of each other. Wow. Both okay. of them were DUI. I heard a big huge bam and it sounded like a bomb went off it's probably that one the guy jumped the curb and that yeah. rainier uh plaza sign that sits way up high actually went through that the, the mm -hmm. truck launched and rolled see the damaged yeah sign. and the other one was going uh, eastbound mm -hmm. in the jersey barrier went into the oncoming lane and slid across the lanes of traffic on that one but luckily nobody was seriously in those but they were within a couple hours of each other but that one of the, the Drivers die. Oh, okay. no, nobody, nobody was even seriously injured. I don't wow. think anybody was transported. The one over here was Crazy. walking away when our showed up. Wow. Yeah. I guess they're too drunk to be injured. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Uh, we'll yeah, start off. Yeah, <laughs> start off with uh, some hiring updates too for us. Our community service officer candidate is in the, the last part of the background. We're doing personnel file checks today and tomorrow. We're hoping to have that person on by March 16th. And it is a corrections offer, officer from Puyallup. So I heard somebody really smart hired her at Puyallup. So another steal for us. Um, as far as the officers go, we have, great job. Yeah. <laughs> we have one entry level who has completed the background process. We have another one that's close to completing it. We're trying to get those, hire them simultaneously so we can get them into the academy together. And then we also have a lateral applicant going through the, the background and we're about probably halfway through. And uh, so hopefully if things go well, we could have the entry level on by April 1. We're trying to, the tricky part is trying to find out when we can get them into the academy because we're being told six to eight months just to get them into the academy. But I'm going to try to get a hold of the director and uh, play the, the Todd Green card, who was our instructor there for three years when we never sent anybody to the academy. Because if you have an, if you contribute a, an instructor, you get priority for the academy. In our three years, we never sent anybody. So I'm just saying, hey, how about a little retro pay for us? See if we can get them in. But you know, all she can do is say no. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about the increase in Hyundai and Kia thefts that are nationwide due to some TikTok challenges somebody has figured out. And we're not talking older vehicles. These are brand new vehicles that they've figured out how to steal. Um, our administrative assistant, Haley, contacted both Hyundai and Kia, and they are sending us each 80 vehicle locks, so 160 vehicle locks to give away to Kia and Hyundai owners to help them keep their cars safe. So that'll be coming here soon. Those were wheel locks? Yeah, steering wheel. Okay. Yeah, the club kind of things. Okay. You may or may not have noticed if you follow us on Facebook, we started something yesterday, a uh, blotter. A lot of the agencies are doing that to keep our citizens up to speed on what's going around. And again, it's just the highlights. It's not every single call, but we're going to try to do it every two weeks so we can post something, kind of a, uh, the highlights of what's going on to kind of showcase the good work that the officers are doing out there. And because um, otherwise people don't know what's going on. They just kind of see and they, they wonder what's going on. So, so far, the results were pretty favorable on that. I think people want to know what's going on in the community. So I think that's another good way for us to engage with our citizens on that. In that same vein, we have petitioned Leslie and all her authority to create an Instagram account for the police department, another social media means of uh, interacting with our citizens. It's a little more casual, a little more fun way to interact, I'm told, with our citizens. <laughs> so. Uh, I did actually have open an Instagram account. I don't know how to use it, but so that way, if it's people you may know, yeah, yeah, at least this way I can see what's going on. Because on Facebook, I'm not a Facebooker, but I can at least log on to our page and kind of see what's going on. Um, but Instagram won't let you do that. So we're hoping to get that up and running. We have a, a group of young officers who are really into the social media and, and tech savvy, and they really want to interact with the community. So they're the ones driving this. And, I'm just kind of staying out of the way and letting them get it done. So those are coming up. Uh, I think it was November, maybe October, we talked about automated school zone enforcement. I have a company that is doing surveys right now in our school zones. They did Bonnie Lake Elementary last week. They're doing Bonnie Lake High School on 104th this week. I think they're going to do Bonnie Lake High School Mountain View on 199th the week after that, and then they're going to do Emerald Hills West South Taps the week after that, and then they'll get the data back. I'll bring it back, and we can discuss uh, moving forward on, on how they do that. They uh, How it usually works is similar to the red light cameras. They provide all the infrastructure. There's no initial cost to the city unless that's changed. I'm sure they'll tell me, um, and then they get a percentage of the uh, fines that, that come through for that, and also if the school zones don't have the flashing beacons. They provide those as well. So the only one that doesn't is, well, actually, there's two of them, 104th in front of Bonnie Lake High School by the, the football field there. They don't have them. And we're in the process of installing them on 199th. Bonnie Lake and Emerald Hills both have the flashing school zone. So we'll be able to see how many violators a day are coming through there. will give us a, a chance to see if it's viable. We talked about 
the officers, uh, and the other thing is there's no safe place to work traffic on, especially on, in front of the high school there on 199th or 104th uh, without a motorcycle and we don't have the traffic unit anymore. And this also takes the accusations of targeting specific people or races or vehicles, if it's automated, uh, the computer just writes tickets to those who are speeding. It's a force multiplier for us. We can get people to slow down in the school zones and we can send our officers elsewhere where they're needed. So it's kind of a win-win. The, the downside is we will need somebody to review each one of those tickets. And depending on what the survey says, we're fairly confident we can accomplish that with the staff that we have in place where we wouldn't have to add anybody. So that's kind of what we're looking at. But as I said, when these when I get the data back, I'll bring it back and share that with the, the committee and we can decide where you want to go from there. So each individual mm -hmm. ticket has to be reviewed. Yes. Wow. Yep. Is that even video red light? Yes. Oh, my yep. word. And they post the video. I know this because <laughs> I got one in Scottsdale. <laughs> you can watch yourself speeding past the little white truck. <laughs> we had a white truck. They they just have cameras. But yeah, that was fun. <laughs> my first ticket in a very long time. I was not well, at least this one won't go on your record. It's like a parking ticket in Washington yeah. here, similar to the red light. And there's a whole bunch of changes to it. So I, I, I'm going to have to dive in it further. I know Sumner has it, Puyallup has it, Fife has it. Um, so I'll be I'll be talking to them and about how their program works. But I know you have to, uh, Sumner's chief was telling me, you have to vet each neighborhood where these are going in to make sure it's not going to adversely impact communities of either low of poverty or uh, there, there's a whole bunch of things that we have to do ahead of time. So this, if you guys decide this is something you want to do, it's not going to be like, okay, let's flip switch tomorrow. It's probably a one year to 18 month process to get it to the finish line, to get it implemented. So I, I think maybe uh, mid school year 24, if you guys decide to do this might be a, you know, a, a goal. It, is this is this camera able to be adjusted even in time frames? Yeah, yeah, they're all you set it all changes, by computer. Based on what time it is. Yeah, by time of day yeah. and day of week okay. and summer break, winter break, all yeah. that is scheduled in okay. to a program. And like today, if there's a snow day mm -hmm. and it's delayed or it's canceled, it right. just there wouldn't be any tickets written if it's canceled, or the time okay. would be adjusted. So yeah, there there are ways to do that. Right now, we program them too to coincide with the school day, and with uh, any holidays and weekends. Um, I live off of 104th, and um, I know that you know people um, they drive fairly slowly by Bonnie Lake, and as soon as they pass the field, they are just bombing down mm -hmm. that. It's like a roller coaster, <laughs> um, to, uh, all the way to the. So is. Is the plan just to have it in the school zone? That's or? the only place we can have it by law okay. is in the school zone. Yep. Yeah, there there is legislation to, to add it to construction zones, okay. but you can't just have uh, for speed emphasis. It has okay. to be right now. It's only authorized in school zones okay. for, for radar enforcement. They were given a pilot project, the only one in the state for the end of River Road. There, that's the okay, only yeah, one in the state. That's the one I was going to point out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were given, and that, that was three years ago, and I don't okay. even know if it's still active. Yeah, it's, it's it is. Yeah, we got well, one. It's not active. <laughs> no, we know, yeah. Oh, okay. Because I, I didn't see the signage when I was down there a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's, it's one, it's it's one you're getting. Uh, Which one? West. The box? Like, across yeah, the I saw the box, yeah, but I didn't, a, I didn't see the signage. Signage is before the bridge, before you hit the traffic light. Oh, it so is. Electronic traffic enforcement ahead. Now you go around the bend, right? Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's, still it's been there for a bend. while, but that's, yeah, that's the only one that's allowed in the state. It was a pilot project and must have an infinite date because it's been going for at least seven years there. Well, and you, I would suggest that when you talk with the other cities, ask them what percentage of people actually pay it. Um, in Seattle, when they put in a lot of their red light cameras, including the schools, um, they pretty much had an unwritten policy, but everyone knew it. Because that ticket, like you said, doesn't go to a driver, it goes to the vehicle. If the vehicle owner just said, I don't know who was driving my car that day, after two years, they just let it go. They, we did that in Puyallup too, mm -hmm. That's what, and it's written into the law that way. So um, I know that the collection, and they, they send them to collections too, but again, the, the collection rate, 
I, I know it's not 100 percent. Probably closer to 60 or 70. It's way lower. It's under 50. But I want. We paid ours. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see the good people. The yeah. Get yeah. So. Uh, yeah. On that, chief. Uh, there's a company out of Arizona that manages this, right? Uh, some of them. They're one of them. I know. I think Red Flex is from okay. Arizona. The one Nova Geo something is the one that's just doing our survey right now. Okay, um, but it would need to be one of our officers that reviews it, or one of Bonnie Lake. Okay. Yeah. Well, somebody that's commissioned or partial commission. Okay. So our CSOs, our our thought would be is have one of our CSOs do it if we have the capacity. Okay. We would not take a full fully commissioned officer off the street to do it. And then uh, one final update, I think I mentioned that we were successful in getting a grant from the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, a wellness grant for $20,000 for gym equipment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were successful in evicting Chuck from the building. And that when that building was built, that was his office was the, we had a gym in there before. And then it uh, went away for a period and now it's back. The officers did a really good job of acquiring equipment and uh, really fixed it up. So it's uh, it's been a very positive for our officers because we, we try to give them an hour to work out on shift. We want to, I know the fire department gives like 10 hours a shift to work oh. out, but we could only eat out <laughs> one. So, and your guys have been coming over and salivating on here too, <laughs> trying to sneak over there and use it. But uh, it's, it's a great investment in our officers because yeah. a lot of them are very conscious about their health and about, you know, they, they understand the importance of being physically fit and being well. And it, it has been received fantastically. It helps officer safety by being able to do it on right. site rather than go to a gym. Yeah. yeah. Either stuff in a locker. Exactly. I was there the night they were setting it up. The one you ride along? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just about done now. I think they have a rowing machine they need to get. And uh, I think that's about it. But they put the rubber floor down, and uh, they all they totally repainted it, and yeah, it looks really nice. We do have to probably get a HVAC because it's hot up there. It's probably the only place in our building that is hot in the winter is that room. <laughs> so we're gonna have to look at getting a mini split and putting that in there, so it's not ungodly hot in the summer when they're trying to work out. But yes, it was very successful. I just wanted to give some kudos to Officer Rimsky. Uh, I unfortunately had to be at the uh, multi care ER the other night with my daughter and watched her handle a, a gentleman that was more than 100 pounds uh, heavier than her. And I wouldn't say he was combative, but he was certainly not wanting to be cooperative and in line and, and do it in such a professional way that no one else really saw what was going on and handled herself. So, fantastic. Job. Good to hear. I'll pass it on. I think that was uh, one of the intoxicated drivers she had arrested. I, I believe so. Yeah. She had to, to, he tried running from her on scene too. So she had to grab him all five foot five of her yeah. and uh, was able to do it. Well, I know she's ex military. So yep. I, I know and she she's she a defensive him. tactics instructor. Oh, so, yeah. okay. yes, very capable oh, young lady. And she's yeah. also the driving force behind the blotter and the Instagram. Mm -hmm. She's been doing a lot of that on her own. So she, we're very lucky to have her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Back to right meeting here. All right. We'll go on to um, item number three, emergency management report. Regine's not here. Is there anything? You yeah, Regine's not here. Uh, the reports in your packet tonight. Tonight, I think one of the takeaways is she's working on the comprehensive emergency management plan, and then she gave a presentation to the city's management team the other day on the operations plan. Also, later in her report, there's a number of online trainings that are available as well. If you want to get up on your uh, ICS training, and if you have any questions, certainly reach out to Rangy. There was a time last year I was involved in some sort of emergency management training or, or team. Is that still going on? Yes, yes. So she has that on 17. So on we have our emergency operations center team monthly meeting. Higher level EOC team that's just comprised of the directors of either. Oh, okay.
We'll move on to item number four, prosecutor office monthly report. All right, thank you, Council Member Evans. So in January, we had a total of 366 hearings. We had um, 34 arraignments, so that's uh, new charges that are being filed. We also had um, one jury trial. Um, the defendant was charged with uh, two crimes, uh, theft in the third degree and driving while license suspended in the third degree. Uh, we had an issue with um, one witness who we had confirmed it the week of, the week prior, and 4 p.m. the day of the the day before the trial. It was a one of the former loss prevention officers at Home Depot. Uh, he did not show up for the trial, so rather than um, trying to get a material witness warrant, we just pressed forward with the trial uh, because we did have another loss prevention officer. Um, but. Um, I think because we were missing that witness, um, the jury found the defendant guilty of the theft third degree, but not guilty of the driving while license suspended third degree. So we still got a guilty verdict. Uh, he was sentenced to 182 days in jail. Uh, Deputy Mayor Carter um, attended the trial and he just watched and observed. So um, if you're curious about how it went or how many questions, um, I'm happy to answer questions, but he also attended and he had some feedback about uh, use of the projection screen when we showed the Home Depot surveillance footage. Um, so he had some comments about that that um, we've talked about with um, Doc and also um, Kathy, the court administrator. How we do evidence because in the future everything either has body worn camera and or footage. Um, for discovery um, in January, um, we provided uh, 65 discovery packets to defense attorneys. And we processed 232 pieces of evidence, um, electronic evidence on evidence.com. That's the cloud-based uh, platform that we use um, that stores body-worn camera, surveillance video, and photographs. Um, also in January 1, uh, January 1st, the new public defender, Mr. Michael Harbison, uh, took over uh, Donna Johnston. Uh, Donna Johnston is no longer the public defender. We have a new contract with Michael Harbison. Um, we're on opposite sides, but so far it's great working with him. It's going really well. Uh, the only hiccup we have is the uh, old public defender. She never set up her own electronic file system. So all the discovery we sent her via evidence.com starting around May and June of last year, she never saved any of it. So we are having to resend um, around six or seven months worth of discovery to him. Um, so Kristen Visna, our legal specialist, is doing a great job going, working with his um, paralegal to make sure that he has all the discovery on the cases. But it is a, a big backlog of discovery that we're having, not backlog, but a big project to go back and resend all of that discovery. Is that how far you are right now from prosecution is five or six months? No. Um, so if they're in pretrial status that they didn't enter a guilty plea, and I think the last count, it's about 150-ish cases that we're having to resend. But May, June of last year is when we transitioned to evidence.com. I think it was beta tested in May and went live, oh, fully okay. live in June. Um, so that means there's officer body worn camera, but also if a store or random citizen has either photos or video on the phone or a ring camera or store surveillance, <laughs> The officer gives them a link and then they can that person can upload directly to that. So all of that evidence for every case, um, Ms. Johnston never downloaded. And so she basically said she can't forward it to the new public defender. So our office is having to reprovide it to the, the new public defender. Is that quite a process? Or it, that, yeah, it's it quite a process. Yeah, I think it's going to take us at least because it's it's half a year's worth of discovery. Yeah. Like it's not just resending the link. To no, unfortunately, it's not that easy because you have to click through it. And then just to protect us, we always do a cover letter with what we provided just to protect ourselves. So in case it's on the eve of trial, they try to claim, oh, you never provided me X. Yeah. You know, we have a new discovery cover sheet we do where we say we provided you the police report, you know, was previously provided Ms. Johnston. We're now only providing you the evidence.com stuff, and this is, and we list it all out as kind of a. Oh, okay. And Kristen has to go through and click through and email it to Mr. Harbison or, or his paralegal. Wow. Yeah, so unfortunately, it's not as easy as going through your sent folder <laughs> on your email and just hitting forward yeah. you know, 150 times. Wow. Is there a reason why there was a change in the public defender? Um, there was a, a contract proposal period, and um, I think city leadership decided to go. Her, her contract expired December 31st of last year. They are wanted to issue an RFP, and we did that. 
and council approved that contract. Can I ask if the new contract now requires new defender, public defender to do that work that you mentioned? So at the end of is her term that he won't be in the same? So I, I'm not sure if there's a provision in his contract, but I know that he has electronic files. Um, he is fully electronic, so we should not have this issue with him. I think the prior public defender, he was more old school and had paper files. And so <coughs> midway through last year when we went to evidence.com, she didn't have a system for downloading anything. Um, and then the only other update, um, in December, we um, got our prosecutor by Carpel software. A person from the software company came out and trained us all on it. Um, thank you for funding that. It's really been great for our office. Um, it interfaces directly with evidence.com. So all of those body more camera videos, surveillance videos and photos were able to automatically get into our files. Um, it also makes um, processes run a lot smoother in our office if you have somebody down in court they need something from somebody upstairs, like if they need some, them to call a witness or a victim, they can also access the file at the same time um, electronically, so we're not having to look for files. We're able to update and make notes a lot faster. Uh, we can also look cases up by based on victim's name. So if we have a victim or a witness call us, they don't know the defendant's name necessarily or um, the case number, so we can just put their name in, and so we're able to, to move, run a lot smoother and faster. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things we'll be talking about in open is um, what Terry witnessed while he was here about the possible iPads or bigger screen mm -hmm. options. So that up shortly. Thank you. If that is the end of our reports. We'll go on to business and action items, AB 2030, resolution 3126, authorizing out-of-state travel or peer counseling team. And we'll piggyback this with AB 2333, resolution 20, 3129, for auto theft training as well. Was there one more for this one, Chief? Or that the next one is going to be, There's the other one's not as time sensitive as these two. Okay. So these two are both grant funded, will be reimbursed 100%. The first one, we have a grant with the East Pierce County Coalition of Peer Support Members. It's Bonnie Lake, Buckley, Sumner, Duallup, Fording. I think that's, that's it. We'll be sending three from Bonnie Lake to this peer counseling training in, um, California. And then the other one is for our auto theft task force detective. He is going to, <laughs> going to, yeah, Palm Springs. He's going to California as well. And this is for chop shop training, teaching them how to find and investigate chop shops. So again, it won't cost the city anything other than we have to front the money and we get reimbursed for it. And both of these are on your consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Do I have any questions or concerns about that being on consent? All right, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, approval of meeting minutes. I didn't see anything. Did you attach anything for Debbie? All right. Move those forward as approved. Um, open discussion, page 37, uh, shooting sports facilities code. All yeah. right. Yes. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Evans. So I included in your packet a sample of uh, Gig Harbor's um, code regarding uh, shooting sports facilities. Um, Basically, there was an incident um, before um, I came to the city full time back in June of 2019, where um, a residence that's about 555 feet away from that specific shooting range in Bonnie Lake had um, a Fife Police Department was training. There were some bullets uh, later. The resident heard gunshots, found some bullets in their uh, their home. Officers came out and looked for it. Um, and there are some, they did some measurements about the berm and how high the house is. So they, they do think that those bullets came from that um, shooting facility. So, uh, or that gun range. So um, this, it was a city, I think at this point, I kind of wanted you to discuss it and see, you know, what your, um, your direction you'd like to take or if you have any questions. This is just eventually raising the berm and following it, it would it would regulate the facility, so they would um, they would have you know to comply. We would set out regulations for like raising the berm, and, you know, safety things about like when they can shoot and stuff like that. Are we the only authorized people there now? Now, yeah. because of that incident, and I will say that the Fife was not in compliance with safety measures. That berm that they were shooting at for the drill that they were shooting could not have happened at that berm. 
So the five firearms instructors were not as familiar with the layout as our officers were, and they didn't walk behind. But uh, they, they, if they wanted to do that drill, they should have used the main berm. This was a, a berm that was on the side, and uh, the drill that they were doing was not conducive for that. And the, they were obviously unfamiliar with the range. So it, it's not a fault of the range design. It's a fault of the firearms instructors not paying attention to what drill they were running on what part of the range. So I, I wanted to say that. First of all, that uh, in our that's why Bonnie Lake is only allowed to use it now. They've cut off all other agencies because our firearms instructors are very familiar with the backdrops and those houses up there. Um, so that's why Bonnie Lake is the only one allowed to use it. I think it was two years ago yesterday. I was fortunate to go out and witness your guys' uh, dusk training and the, yeah, the the amount of emphasis on safety ahead of time versus. Other ranges I've been at where they just go out and just start shooting. We were in that room for 30, 45 minutes, just going over all the different safety features ahead of time and range officers on site at all times. So I, I know it's certainly a critical aspect. You guys take good control of there. So yeah, we don't want to lose that range. It's the only one around. Yeah. If, if we didn't have that range, we would have to send our officers to uh, Black Diamond out <clears> to Roy. <throat> It's tough. We could send them to Tacoma, but getting on their range is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Only shotgun down in summer, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, there are no berms down there. I think they're very high. They, we couldn't shoot our rifles or our pistols there. Um, I guess my question is, uh, I am not in fan of uh, in favor of adding solutions. I think um, my question is in regards to gig code. Um, I did read through it. And uh, my question is, uh, does Bonnie Lake have any kind of codes in reference to shooting sports facilities, or is this, we don't have a specific code. For oh, okay. What's driving this? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, well this came about after that incident. Oh. In, in 2019, the members of the Public Safety Committee at that time wanted to bring something like this forward. Oh, okay. I, I'll admit, languished on my desk for years <laughs> and, and I were talking about just like who wants any others on behalf of the community. Yeah, I don't think so. It seems like we're punishing the facility for something that wasn't necessarily yeah, there's a lot of um yeah there's a lot of regulations that have to be made because of that that seem over this until Over the a, top. another committee decides to re-engage it? No, or I don't think it needs to be engaged. It doesn't no, sound like I, they were. No, what I'm saying is table this until yeah. a committee that doesn't involve the three of us decide to bring it back up. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. All right. That yeah. was kind of punish the facility. They, well, they, they've I, already I, taken I, the action. They'd have to shut down sure that with all of the different yeah, regulations and that they're going to have to do. Yeah. And I know that they're very safe. They mostly yeah. shoot shotgun there, so it's 22. That yeah. berm that Fife was using, it's a 22 range where they shoot from a covered area. Yeah. And it's it's a straight trajectory, not up, which Fife was shooting and up. So uh, the Swiss has been very cautious about using that range, and they're, they're very safety conscious as well. I don't think that 22, a 22 would have made it that far from the covered range to the house. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't. The heck? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, on to open discussion. I have uh, two things I'd like to talk about. One is the power box at the AMPM. Is that ours at all? I, we have a lot of incidents where that takes out 90% of the power in our city. Mm -hmm. If it's been hit twice, in someone the past two years. drinks and drives on Super Bowl and takes that <laughs> full out, or is texting. Yeah. Uh -oh. Is there a way we can put a bollard there? Is that something we can request through PSC? I don't know who owns uh, I, yeah, that. Yeah, I'm trying to look into it with PSC. I know it's I mean, it's, yeah, it's obviously it's not our power box. Yeah, it's just yeah. off the road on a major highway. Yeah. Most critical infrastructure of our city. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly ask Ryan okay. to reach out to our Okay, thank you. And then the other thing I had was um, uh, kind of what you brought up about uh, when Terry was here, they were looking at some footage, and the footage was pretty grainy. The uh, overhead projector is fine for viewing text. 
PowerPoint presentations. It's not necessarily the greatest for mm -hmm. looking at videos mm -hmm. and surveillance footage. So uh, he said you were, you, he'd talked to you about, or you'd mentioned uh, a larger TV on wheels or like iPads for the jury or something that was a, a little higher quality that could be um, help, help out the cases by being able to identify what you're attempting to identify there. But you mentioned you're already working with Chuck on, on that. Like he's going to improve the protector. Yeah, so on, Deputy Mayor reached out to me uh, after that jury trial. He said, in and brought up this issue. Others, uh, I talked to Chuck um, McKeelan. Uh, Chuck reminded me that we director for the council chambers, uh, and he wanted to wait and see how the visual. Uh, it's just not as simple as buying, you know, and your peers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, 15 iPads yeah. and making them all. Chuck's, Chuck's opinion was, let's see how the new projector works. And then certainly that would be something we can consider in the mid night. Okay, for jurors. Yeah, because I mean, you'd have to upload that link to something and everyone would have to yeah. click the link at the same time or see it. And... The way I've seen it is that it's similar to back in the day when the when you're on an airplane and the, the oh, seat yeah. in front of you had an embedded. I've seen it in, like, when I was in the Air Force, JAG Corps. They had permanently like mounted iPad screens, so they were all like hardwired oh, to okay. whatever you're projecting on. Have a clear, you know, obviously that you know costs money and involved in because with that council space is used for different purposes, court versus council. I don't know how easy it would be to have something that you can wheel out and then wheel away. To Everybody. I mean, it's kind of how we already do things up there when a presentation is being done. All eight monitors are showing the right. same thing. You just the remote, but the um, jurors don't sit up there. That's where no, I know you almost yeah. need something else that could plug in that right. can mirror those. Yes, so first thought was we'll see how we can protect them. Okay, that's all I had. Anyone have anything else for open discussion? Just had um, two more things oh, yeah, I just thought of that. Well, go ahead. Um, I was when I did my ride along, one of the suggestions was possibly getting a, like a phlebotomist, somebody that training some of the officers to so that we don't have to go around to different areas. Is that something you're interested in bringing to council at some point? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that it would be a council issue. It's more of just whether we have the volume to send somebody to that training. Mm -hmm. I think what we have 50 some DUIs last year and most of the time we're just getting blood draws now, but if that phlebotomist isn't working, mm -hmm. you still got to go to the hospital. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's a cost benefit analysis kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we have one officer who's interested in doing it, but is not a, a super aggressive DUI enforcement person. So I, I want to make sure that the cost benefit works out because it is expensive to send them to the training. It's time consuming. And then you have to make them available to other agencies as well. So it's, it's a big commitment. I want to make sure that we have the volume because prior to last year, I think we had 30 some DUIs. I don't know that that would justify sending somebody for that additional training and having them off the street. And, you know, they call all the time. I hear them on the radio. Is there a phlebotomist on? And then they'll come and do it. I think the fire department should be trained, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> You're the medics. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, we are we are looking into that, doing the cost benefit of it. I know Lakewood does it, and uh, I think maybe Puyallup. I'm not sure. If I didn't know if you needed to, to have, them. like, funds it, to, it's to possible. put somebody into it's, the You have to go to board. the actual, yeah. I think, is it Bates that does that? I would assume you know, so, yeah. Bates Technical that College does. You college. actually become a phlebotomist so they yeah. could go work on their off-duty time and yeah. be a phlebotomist if they wanted to. So we are looking into it. Uh, what the other two, two, two quick items. I forgot to mention to you that we uh, stole Casey Gallagher from the clerk's office. She's now a records clerk with us. We started on February 1st. So um, it was great kind of plug and play, and she's fitting in really, really well. She helped and, me with my CPL the other day. Did she? Perfect, yeah. Yeah, she is. Uh, she yeah, she hit the ground running. She's doing fantastic, like we knew she would. And then the second thing is last week at CDC, Ryan Johnstone brought to the CDC the issue of boat trailer parking. And right now, uh, I was, is it coming to the next workshop? Not this one with the planning, because it's a joint planning meeting, but the one after that. Yeah, I think, it was going to <clears throat> They're bringing it to a workshop to talk about the plan for boat trailer parking and council's direction. Because as it stands right now, we will have 26 spots for this year for boat trailer parking, which means it's going to have to be monitored both the launch and the lot. 
So that that will be coming to council for a decision on what you all want to do with uh, Allen York Park again this year. Those are the 26 temporary spots here. Yeah, the one that they yeah. took ball field for parking, yeah. changed it, but we should have the additional parking around the new ball field this year, where last year we didn't have that. We basically yeah. displaced everybody if we would have done the boat trailer. This year, the plan is to have 26 spots. So the discussion, obviously, would be what, what do you do? Is it first come, first serve? City residents get preference? Do you uh, give them boat passes? And when it's full, it's full? Or so that'll be uh, coming up so you guys have a heads up on on that, you'll have another fun decision to make when it comes to the <laughs> Allen York Park this year. Um, I did have a question in regard to that. Um, if if there's going to be 26, I know there's going to be an opening of our you know spots in the other location. But I, I guess in that area, how how then do we manage cars from not parking? You, you would have to have it monitored. Somebody's going to have to be there yes. unless you have it automated. Okay. where there's something that is you, you grab something when you launch and then you know, whether it's a card swipe and then you swipe when you enter that and exit either that or you have to have physically somebody standing there monitoring at both spots so when it's full no more launches unless you're dropping and going or um, you know if one spot opens up but they would have to be staffed by somebody and again you know um, we can't staff it 24 7 so if you get people to get there before it's staffed and it's full, it's full. That's why it's gonna need some discussion on council. But from what uh, Ryan said, that there is no possible way that they would be able to add additional boat trailer parking this year. Is that accurate, John? Yes. Um, so then my question is before we uh, get to that meeting, will Ryan or even Chuck have any suggestions as to an electronic means? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Our, our original discussion was, Twenty to the boat or the ball field for parking. Twenty, which we've done. Which we've done. Twenty-four. We when we approved the ball, ball field for four. itself. Uh, well, some question about whether or not ball field for itself. Or the as far as council. As far as okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Because I know that was you know. Thank you. Some council members it seemed to get up in the air. Yes, but, I do remember. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I believe when when we initially started talking about it, it was in that phase that we were sort of digital gate control with mm -hmm. with a possible expansion in public works is and well, we would need feedback. I like to ask some. Yeah, I think it's also wrapped up in the, the parks, trails, and open space plan that Jason Sullivan's working on. Public okay. What is the community? Because I don't know that I could make a good enough decision for 2025 as far as if we were going to choose an election. What even the choices? What well, would that wouldn't even be this budget cycle. Yeah, yeah there there to. won't be time for an automated this year. It would have to be <laughs> staffed, which again is an added expense. Well, we can do post signs and then also vehicles towed. But again, start that's, towing that's, vehicles like you had to do last home. year. If they park in there, it's a car. It's not allowed. But so. then, yeah, then you you're Parking. tying up our staff to yeah. go in there and have to and deal with that and keeping them from doing other things. And yeah. yeah, and impounding, which is, is fine. But I would not suggest that we try to self-regulate with signs. Not been effective in the other areas, and it would not be effective with the boat trailer parking. Yeah. Could you reach out to Pierce County Security to see what that might cost? Yeah, you? I, I know that uh, AC Keller. I've asked him to do that to add two more. I wanted each spot, okay. and I want to say it's up, up to like thirty-eight or forty dollars an hour. So it would be four people. Okay. And I'm assuming they would just be committed. Correct. Yeah, okay. they probably have either walkie-talkies or cell phones or some means of communication. Okay. So, and it's trying to find the staff because last year we could only get one a lot of the times to staff park cell. So, trying to find two might be a, a little bit difficult too. And uh, again, it's it's you. I think we need to look at the cost-benefit analysis. Twenty-six spots versus eighty dollars an hour to monitor those spots. Yeah, I was thinking. So that's thinking. not my decision, but it's certainly something to think about. Okay. Are we currently charging for boat launch? Yeah. Well, we did last year. Okay. We did the pass for city residents, but 
when, if it is open and the council decides to open it up to everybody, yes, you will be charged again and, and, and residents will be allowed to purchase a year pass. But that's just the pass, so not a for launch? We can do that too, yeah. The only reason we didn't is because we were only offering it to city residents last yeah, year. Yeah, that's, that's functional because I remember at one point the bollards weren't functioning. Well, we don't, yeah. They, uh, we don't use a ballers yeah, anymore. The ballers are still not functioning. No, oh, okay. We so just they receive, just have to put a receipt. Yeah, you it would essentially be a parking pass oh, okay. for a single use slot. Okay. On an honor system? Well, if we have somebody monitoring, they would have to show that to get in. Oh, okay. And if they either that or they have their city resident pass that they would have in their vehicle. What does Pierce County charge? I don't know. It's ten or twelve for the oh, well. You know, and they have a limited number. You know, when you go, they can control it with their right. Yeah. yeah, they yeah. can shut I feel off. Like with it was, their it's point. under ten dollars. Under? Wow, that'd be that'd be cheap. Pierce County Park. Yeah, because ours is seventeen. 18? Well, it's per. It's per. Right. Yeah. Right. If it's ten, I'd be. Wow, that's a good deal. I don't <laughs> think it's. I don't think it's above. Just go. Just for a single car. But for, no, not for a car for a lot. Oh, I don't know. But last fall you opened it up in the fall you opened it up to everyone again so that was one of the um middle of february so two things happened on the lake as we always say the trumpeter swans are almost gone and starting tomorrow or thursday cascade water alliance will start the refill and last year they had it refilled by march 1. so the questions that people are asking now is is the launch is the is the launch open right now I, we haven't been by there it's closed. It's locked. It's usually closed until Labor or Memorial Day weekend. Okay, so you guys it, are it, that has been in the past. I don't. I, I don't think, think that's know. actually what our code says, or at least if not our code, yeah. uh, something on our website. Okay, yeah. that's it's yeah, fifteen dollars. Or rock. Oh, yeah. it's fifteen. Yeah. That yeah, that seems, still seems. So the trailer hard. for launch includes. So that's the, the questions that they're asking. We'll take. We can go buzz out there and look, but you don't. So the, you might want to update the website. The website is really confusing. There's a couple different like old sites up there, but if people just type in Allen York, there's kind of a police thing, there's a city thing, and then there's like an old thing. And so people are confused about what, you know, what is it gonna be? Even if it just said, hey, we're, you know, we're having made our decision and it's pending. Anyone else for open discussion or the good of the order? All right, thank you everybody. We will adjourn this meeting. You wanted the 2020 annual release report? Yeah, 2020. Oh.